Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, plenary lecture on Ludwig von Mises. It's about time. It's Thursday morning. We're into the uh, fourth day of the Mises Summer University 2015. And it's about time that we have a lecture on Ludwig von Mises. <laughs> uh, in former summer universities, we had this at the beginning. Um, and in, in, in fact, some of the lecturers already said a few words uh, here and there on uh, the patron uh, saint of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. So there's a reason why this is the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Uh, it's not because other economists hadn't said anything uh, of, of value, but Ludwig von Mises definitely is a very important uh, economist. Uh, possibly uh, the one, uh, certainly one of the most important in the history of economic uh, thought, and in my eyes, the best uh, economist uh, that ever lived so far. Of course, we are all hoping that you, or maybe not all of you, this is unlikely, but, but at least <laughs> some of you will step into his footsteps and uh, also do great things in the future. Right? So there's no, no monopoly on, on greatness. Uh, in my lecture, I'll start off, as usual, with a few hints uh, to further readings, uh, and then I'll uh, walk through the main life stations of uh, Mises. Then come to talk uh, in a third step about his major works and give you an overview and also try to characterize Mises' uh, research uh, methodology and Mises' research orientation, what was he striving to do. And uh, I'll conclude with a few remarks on the significance of Mises within the history of, of economic thought and uh, the, the history of uh, uh, ideas uh, in the 20th century and uh, significance for our own day. So as far as readings are concerned, um, uh, primary mater material uh, can be found in, in, in two books, uh, Ludwig von Mises' memoirs that, have, uh, that he wrote in, in German uh, in the early years of World War II. And then he confided the, the manuscript to his wife and said, you do with this what you wish, but only once I, I'm gone. Right? So then effectively he died in 1973. And Margaret von Mises had uh, the manuscript uh, copy edited and typed, uh, typeset and so on. It was published under the title Notes and Recollections in 1978 and has recently been retranslated and uh, published under a new title, Memoirs, uh, which is more faithful to the German original Erinnerungen uh, in 2009. Then uh, Margaret von Mises has uh, published uh, her own recollections of her years with Ludwig von Mises, also in 1978. Here in the Mises Institute, we have copies of Mises' correspondence um, throughout his entire career. So we have uh, the originals are in um, uh, Grove City College, his post-World War II correspondence. And the originals of the pre-World War II correspondence are now in the Austrian um, government archive, the Staatsarchiv uh, in Vienna. For a long time, they had been uh, stored in, in, uh, in Moscow, in Russia. So here at the Mises Institute, you have access to all this pri these primary sources. And those of you who are inclined to do research in the history of ideas, uh, biographical work, and so on, will find everything you need as far as this primary stuff is concerned. Then, uh, as far as biographical works are concerned, um, uh, the most uh, 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 important one, uh, I think, is still Murray Rothbard. He has uh, written two very nice, concise presentations of Mises' life and his contributions to economics. Uh, the Essential for Mises uh, was published uh, shortly after Mises' uh, death or in the, in the same year. And then Ludwig von Mises, Scholar, Creator, Hero, in uh, 1988. I didn't check whether we have it still on sale, but I suppose it's still downstairs, so you can acquire this. And this is a wonderful uh, introduction for those of you who uh, who just want to read 40, 50 pages on the subject. Uh, then there is a, a British uh, scholar, Eamon Butler, who has uh, written a, a nice book on Ludwig von Mises as the fountainhead of modern microeconomic revolution. And uh, Israel Kiltzner, a famous uh, uh, student of Ludwig von Mises, wrote a biography and published a biography in 2001. Uh, Richard Eveling uh, is um, uh, a scholar who has published a great number of articles and uh, edited uh, uh, several volumes of, of writings of Ludwig von Mises assorted with his uh, 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 introductions 
a very insightful introduction, so I rec recommend these works as well. And then finally, there is a talented uh, young uh, German uh, author that is he's no longer that, that young, but formerly young, uh, who published a Mises biography in 2007, which is now on sale also downstairs. <laughs> And you might think that the price is uh, exaggerated, but I tell you, you will get your money's worth. And plus, always consider it's a multifunction volume. Okay, so you can use it as a doorstopper. And uh, <laughs> if you have small children at home, you can seat them on it. So this is. <laughs> okay. Live stations of Mises. Uh, Mises was born in uh, September 1881 in uh, uh, what at the time was called Austria-Hungary. Uh, and Austria-Hungary was, in those days, the second largest uh, political uh, uh, entity in Europe. So the, the largest one was, was Russia. I just found this German map. Uh, the Germans are always quicker. Put this stuff on the net. So I feel the Russian Reich, the Russian Empire. So he, you not only learn. Austrian economics and, and Mises stuff, he also learned some German. Huh? So uh, repeat after me, Russisches Reich. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So Austria-Hungary was the second largest uh, entity after Russia, uh, uh, so bigger than Germany, France, uh, Sweden, uh, and of course, the, the, these islands. <laughs> Third largest country in population after uh, Russia and uh, Germany. And Mises was more particularly born, he was uh, he, uh, born in Galician. Repeat after me, Galician. Galician. Very nice. Bitte <laughs> Okay, then we can we do Deutsch weiter machen. <laughs> so, uh, Galician, you see, this is the northeasternmost part of um, uh, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. We have a little look, zooming in into this, and so he was born, so this is Austria-Hungary. So, and he was born here in the city of Lemberg, so quite close to the Russian uh, border. In fact, Galicia uh, shifted uh, so political uh, affiliation uh, many times in, in the course of history. Uh, so, formerly it belonged to um, uh, Poland. Uh, today it belongs to Ukraine. So, the, uh, the Polish name, I believe, is Vov, and the uh, Ukrainian name is Lviv. So, if you look at it on the map today, it's Lviv. And uh, you still have there, for those who are inclined to travel, uh, you still have the old architecture typical of the uh, uh, 19th century Austro-Hungarian Empire in the city, and they're cultivating it, they're maintaining it. And some people, uh, uh, some locals have even discovered Ludwig von Mises, have rediscovered Ludwig von Mises. So there is now a sign on, uh, his, uh, on a house that formerly belonged to his family. We don't know whether uh, this is the birthplace. Uh, but so in any case, so there is now something, there is something in for Mises tourists who go to uh, these areas. And some uh, uh, scholars and uh, uh, members of the Mises Institute have already done excursions to Lemberg. So the, for example, Don Prince, I think he, he went there. And uh, Yuri Maltsev, Professor Maltsev, uh, went there too uh, with a group of students. Yeah, so this is where, where Mises was born and spent the first years of his life. His family was original from this area. And his father worked uh, as an engineer for the Austro, uh, uh, Austrian uh, Railway Company. So it was a, probably a private company, which was then uh, nationalized. So the father moved to uh, the Ministry of Transport, uh, or even of the Railway Ministry, in Vienna. Right? So then the family followed him uh, in the early 1990s, uh, 1890s to Vienna. And Ludwig was then schooled. In, in Vienna and went to um, uh, what we would translate today as a high school, um, uh, gymnasium. But the, uh, truly the gymnasium was, uh, was a very specialized school, the, the, the point of which was to um, uh, bring the students uh, up to, to a university level uh, in, in the course of six or seven years. Uh, so only 5% of the population, approximately, of an age cohort would go to, to that kind of school. And of course, they came from families that were sufficiently well off because they had to pay fairly high tuition fees and so on. And uh, the high school degree that they had, you must imagine this as at least being equivalent to a bachelor degree uh, today. Okay. 
Uh, so they had higher mathematics, of course, but uh, they were fluent in, in, in Greek and in Latin and so on. So a very high level uh, of uh, very high standard in those schools. So after school, Mises went to the University of Vienna uh, to study uh, law and uh, uh, soon discovered his interest for political science and economics. So he uh, specialized in economics and um, graduated in 1906 with a doctoral degree, which at the time the only doctoral de degree that they um, uh, awarded was uh, the one in law. So he obtained a uh, doctor juris in 1906. After school, he uh, went to work for the treasury uh, department uh, of um, uh, the Austrian government. Right? So this, the country is Austria-Hungary, but in fact, it was uh, there's a reason why it's called Austria-Hungary, because there were two uh, distinct uh, political entities within that country. One was Hungary and the other one uh, were the, the countries affiliated to the Austrian crown. Okay, There was the Austrian crown, there was the Hungarian crown, and then there was the Austro-Hungarian uh, emperor. Okay, and uh, okay, so I'll, I'll spare you those details. We could do a class just, just on this. Uh, anyway, so Mises did not work for the Austro-Hungarian um, uh, treasury, he worked for the uh, Austrian uh, treasury department, which was uh, the main career step for all uh, young people. So uh, his professor uh, Böhm Barwerk had done the same thing. Uh, many. So this is this is the uh, the A career track uh, today. But Mises didn't like it. He didn't like uh, the bureaucracy, and he uh, later on made a few disparaging remarks. Uh, on this, so really the, the working in the bureaucracy was nothing for him. Um, there was no scope for initiative, no scope for independent decision making, for judgment, and so on. He just had to execute orders. And certainly this experience inspired him to one of his later books uh, with the title Bureaucracy, which we also have on, on sale downstairs. So some of uh, the descriptions that you find in the book are certainly taken also from personal ex experience, not only from theoretical deliberation. Uh, Mises went on to work for a few months for a law firm and then uh, eventually joined the Chamber of Commerce uh, in uh, Vienna. So this was the Chamber of Commerce for Lower Austria. So Lower Austria is the area, where is my uh, laser? It's the area, you see this here, Lower Austria, right? So this is this area around Vienna. Uh, and in fact, because it, was, it, it, it included the firms uh, operating in and around Vienna, it was the most important Chamber of Commerce within the entire empire. And uh, the Chamber of Commerce played an eminent role in Austrian politics because it provided uh, expert knowledge to parliamentarians, to members of Congress in, uh, in Austrian politics. Because at the time, they were not yet as richly endowed with uh, human resources and, and budgets as a typical member of parliament would be today. So at the time, they were dependent on outside assistance. And as far as economic and financial uh, expertise was concerned, this came then especially from the Chamber of Commerce. So the Chamber of Commerce had a huge impact on Austrian uh, politics uh, in uh, uh, the last two or three decades, but especially in the last decade before World War I, and then again in the time after World War, after World War I. Uh, Mises then uh, worked there about uh, two uh, uh, wait a minute, uh, about uh, six years, and the World War I broke out. So he uh, uh, spent a lot of time on the front, right? and the front was especially for him what the Austrians called the Northern Front, so this front here, uh, so fighting against uh, uh, Russian troops. And at the very end of the war, he was also commanded to, um, wait a minute, I think it's this area here, uh, fighting against uh, Italian troops. And he was successful in, in each time, so this is very good. But what was remarkable was that he had to go to the front in the first place, right? Because most of his uh, colleagues uh, from the university and from the Chamber of Commerce did not, right? They, they stayed at home, like most bureaucrats do also in Washington, right? Few of these guys actually go to Afghanistan or to, to Iraq and so on, right? They're commanding everybody from a safe place uh, behind their desk or elsewhere. Uh, 
in, uh, at home. So that was also the case at, at the time. So why was Mises sent to the front? Well, because of course, I mean, I'm only speculating, right? Nobody knows for sure because there's no documentary evidence. And by the way, it's not the, the kind of things that you would write down in a personnel file, right? We sent this guy to the front to have him killed, right? to, to get rid of him. But of course, that's what you have to think. Right? And Mises was an outspoken uh, a critic of economic policies already at the time. Uh, he was not always an easy person. I'll come to talk uh, about this a little later on, right? So he, he could be very adamant in uh, defending his opinions, and certainly he had sometimes also a harsh, harsh word on his opponent, uh, opponents. And so uh, this might have been a reason to just get him out of uh, the picture so that central planning could take its smooth course in Vienna, which it did. At the very end of the war, Mises returned uh, to, uh, to Vienna and uh, things were going better for him. Um, he was, among other things, he was appointed uh, still by the last emperor, uh, the last emperor uh, of Austria, uh, Charles uh, from Habsburg, Karl von Habsburg, uh, extraordinary uh, professor at the University of Vienna. Now, excellent, extraordinary professor is not an ordinary professor, that is, is, is not somebody who holds a chair. But he is some sort of an adjunct, that is, he is not really paid by the university, but he has, as far as uh, his intellectual standing is concerned, the same status as a, as a full professor. So he was just simply not paid. He was an extraordinary professor, not an ordinary one, but he was still a professor. So he could have doctoral students and could direct research and, and so on and give lectures, of course, which he did uh, during the rest of his uh, years that he spent in Vienna. He stayed uh, uh, in Vienna until 1934. During those years, uh, he continued his Chamber of Commerce activities. He was much involved with um, international negotiations uh, to settle uh, war-related claims. And so there was uh, uh, export commissions and so on accompanying uh, diplomatic missions and so on, uh, debt renegotiations constantly going on. And then there was uh, increased international cooperation also on the level of chambers of commerce. So Mises was a, m a member of uh, international associations of uh, chambers of commerce and so on. In Austria, he played an influential role in um, uh, the discussion of economic policies. Uh, so he uh, led uh, a combat mainly in the form of uh, newspaper articles that he wrote, but also in uh, discussions within committees and so on, about which we do not know much, but he was an expert admitted to these uh, uh, councils as well. So uh, uh, combating, uh, uh, first of all, uh, the introduction of outright socialism in Austria in the immediate World War I period, uh, the post-World War I period, uh, and then in combating hyperinflation, which took place a few years later, because after a war, typically a government is even more bankrupt than usually, so what they did was to finance their expenditure at an increasing uh, pace with the help of the printing press. So unsurprisingly, you get high price inflation rates. And uh, there was much uh, denial at the time that this had anything to do with the uh, monetary policy pursued by the central bank. So Mises was uh, uh, very much on that front too. And then later on, he uh, uh, championed the reintroduction of uh, the gold standard in Austria, which happened and so on. So there were lots of things on which he had a very beneficial uh, impact and which are related in his memoirs. So you will find uh, all of this stuff there uh, in much more detail than I could relate it here. In 1934, then, Mises obtained an offer from uh, the uh, Institute of uh, graduate studies in Geneva. Now, Geneva at the time was the seat of the first international organization, the first major international organization. Uh, is, in fact, there were already two of them. One was the International Labor Office, and the other one was the League of Nations. Today, there are, of course, panoply of uh, international organizations uh, pretty much all over the world, and the, even in the U.S., right, you have... Uh, uh, United Nations and, and, and similar stuff and so on. So we're used to this. At the time, this quite, was quite a uh, was quite a new thing, right? So Geneva was endowed with these two institutions, and so the uh, the bureaucrats uh, on the top they needed qualified labor, qualified assistance. 
So they set up their own school to for to train these uh, the, these people. So that was the mission of the Graduate School of International Studies in Geneva, uh, in which hired then uh, very prestigious uh, professors from all kinds of countries. And Mises was hired on one of those positions. It was uh, in principle a one-year position, but he obtained it six years in a row, and could probably have stayed on longer had it not been for World War II, which broke out in uh, 1939. And then Mises grew a little uh, nervous. Uh, his trust in the uh, Austrian, uh, excuse me, in the, in the Swiss authorities was not perfect, that they would not uh, sur uh, surrender him to the uh, Nazi governments. Because, of course, there was much pressure coming from Germany uh, to uh, neutral countries such as uh, Switzerland, Sweden, um, to um, uh, deliver, to uh, surrender. Uh, regime opponents, right? Known regime opponents, which uh, Mises was, right? It's a little bit like uh, uh, Ed Snowden today, right? A constant uh, demands from the U.S. government that Ed Snowden finally delivered, be delivered to uh, to the U.S. Right? He, because he's a known regime opponent. So Mises then, by precaution, left the country in 1940 and went to the United States. Uh, a very adventurous uh, escape route that led him through France and, and Spain. I relate this in uh, uh, the Mises biography, so you can have a look uh, up there. So he, he arrived in uh, July uh, 1940. He arrived in New York City, and he would stay. Uh, he would make New York City his, his residence for the rest of his life uh, until uh, 1973. Now, without spending too many words on this, you uh, may probably imagine what this means for a person of 59 years. Uh, at the time, in fact, he was almost 15, he was uh, still 58, when he went to the U.S. So he had no network in the U.S. No, he knew a few people, but there was no, really no professional network. He had no uh, source of revenue. He had uh, his, his, his wealth, right? His, his savings and so on were not there. He had to give up everything and start afresh. Very hard decision. Had it not been for this decision, though, Mises probably would not have written much in English, if at all. And so uh, it's, it's very doubtful that that what is known today as Austrian economics, which is uh, very strongly influenced by Mises in the United States, would ever have come to be. So it's a very fateful uh, decision of almost world historic importance. Who knows? Right? We're working hard on this to make it of world historic importance. <laughs> Yeah, so Mises stayed in New York. He, he got along finally because he found uh, funding through the uh, Rockefeller Foundation uh, at first, who had funded some of his projects already before, uh, so during European times. And then uh, essentially, uh, eventually through his association, association with the Association of, uh, of American Manufacturers and similar organizations. Now, some people have claimed that, uh, uh, well, in fact, then Mises was a paid lobbyist, okay, since he received money from the Association of, of Manufacturers. I guess that, that's the argument. So I, I suppose that the same people that think that all professors who are employed at public universities, universities are, uh, should be characterized as minions of the state. I mean, that seems to be the implication. And right? if you characterize everybody just by the source of his revenue, you can find all kinds of name calling to put this in a favorable or less favorable light, right? Well, of course, it's, it's a ridiculous claim because if you look at, at Mises, what he did and what he wrote and what he held, is certainly not somebody who um, uh, tuned uh, his writings and his message uh, to the source of revenue. Right? Certainly not what he would, uh, would have done. And I'll come to uh, talk about this later on. So Mises died then uh, in New York City in uh, October of 1973. And at that point, um, uh, well, Austrian economics was probably at a, at a low point, I mean, even though he himself had created the roots of a renaissance. And there had been a renaissance under his influence, most notably under the, uh, the influence of uh, the works uh, that he had published in the previous decades, and in particular, under the influence of his book, Human Action, uh, which appeared in uh, 1949. So I'll say a few words uh, about his major works, right? So third part of our lecture. 
Mises had written and published four major works. Through his, he was very productive. And there are four works, four major books that stand out and that all of you, especially if you want to go on with Austrian economics and learn more about this, uh, economics, should read at some point in your life. Okay, so these books are the Theory of Money and Credit, right? published first published in 1912, Mises' first book. Uh, the book Socialism, which was published first uh, in 1922. Right? So both of these books published in German, right? Theorie des Geldes und der Umlaufsmittel and uh, Die Gemeinwirtschaft, 1922. And then Human Action, published in English, but there was a German language predecessor uh, under the title of Nationalökonomie, published in 1940. Uh, but which, due to war-related circumstances, would not have made much of an impact, right? So human action had way more influence and to the present day. And then, so this was published in 1949, and then finally, Theory and History, uh, published in uh, 1956. Or oh, 57, 1957. He also published uh, 12 other books, uh, dozens of articles and so on, so there's a lot uh, to read, but it's manageable. It's not like, let's say, Murray Rothbard. Right? Nobody can read as much as Murray Rothbard has written. Right? A few, <laughs> few people can read as much as he has written. Plus, I mean, I'm just talking about his books and articles and so on. Right? I'm not talking about the correspondence. Right? It's literally so. I mean, few people can read as much as this guy has written. It's just unbelievable. Plus, he has... He has read a lot. Yes, so it's possible. Don't give up, but you can also be a very good scholar. <laughs> you can be a very good scholar even if you do, uh, do not uh, have quite the same pensum of, of work as, as Rothbard, right? It's, it's possible. Different ways of being great. Um, now, in the theory of uh, money and credit, uh, I, I just highlight a few contributions uh, of each book. But then, in a way, highlighting these contributions is inadequate, as I will argue in a second step. So first, a few contributions. In the theory of money and credit, uh, Mises um, revises the Austrian theory of value, the theory of value that had been established by uh, Karl Menger in uh, 1871, so the subjective theory of value, and Mises puts it on a, a choice-based foundation. Right? So Mises' roots... Uh, the phenomenon of subjective value within uh, choice, whereas in Karl Menger's uh, conception, this had been much uh, much less clear. Uh, Mises then applies this theory that he has so revised uh, to the phenomenon of money. Right? So Karl Menger himself had not tried to apply the theory of subjective value to money, which is what Mises does, and he solves the, uh, the analytical problems that went to hand with it uh, and which had uh, steered some of his predecessors away from it. Uh, so most notably the, uh, the circular explanation of the value of money, right? The value of a medium of exchange obviously depends on the purchasing power of that medium of exchange. But um, uh, then the purchasing power, for purchasing power to exist, well, there must be an exchange. So people must exchange money. That is, they must already evaluate it somehow. So if they evaluate it somewhere, they must have a notion of the subjective value of that money before they know the, 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 that purchasing power. That seems to be a contradiction, right? And so you explain the purchasing power by the subjective value, and the subjective value depends on the purchasing power. Right? So you're moving in a, in a logical circle. And Mises explained, um, following uh, Friedrich von Wieser, who had laid the foundation to that explanation, he said, no, actually, uh, we don't have a, a, a circular explanation between the subjective value now and the purchasing power now. Rather, the purchasing power now is based on the subjective value now, which in itself is based on the purchasing power of yesterday. Right? So because I already know the purchasing power that money had yesterday, I can form an opinion on the subjective value that money has for me, and based on that subjective uh, value, I can ex now exchange the money that I own or that I want to acquire. Right? Uh, another uh, important uh, contribution that he made, I'll just zoom on one because time is running out, is uh, he, he presented for the first time his business cycle theory, which is uh, today known as the Austrian theory of the business cycle, right? and which holds that 
uh, if uh, there's uh, credit expansion, so an uh, expansion of the art artificial expansion of the money supply in form of fiduciary media through fractional reserve banks, but also the same argument holds for monetary expansion through in a fiat money regime, right? then it's likely that the interest rate be depressed below its natural level. Right? So you have the distinction between the natural level of the interest rate and the, 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 the effective or monetary rate of the interest rate, a distinction that Mises took over from uh, Knut Wicksell, a Swedish economist. So if we have this, uh, then Mises argue then people are likely to start more investment projects than can finally be realized with the available resources within the economy. Right? We can always start as many projects as we wish, right? The other question is, what can we finish? And we are objectively constrained in our ability to finish things because uh, the, the real resources that are available and which we need to finish, right? Consumers' goods to keep us going, right? To, to feed human uh, people. Uh, producers' goods to uh, realize these, uh, to help as tools and so on. Natural resources. All of this is limited and helps only to realize so and so many projects. So if we start too many projects, if we divert, if we dilute our forces, well, then we end up finishing nothing, right? So we get uh, a crisis situation. The crisis situation is the situation which you realize that you have some, done something stupid in the past, right? You realize that you have started too much, too many things that you cannot finish. Right? It's probably an advice that your parents give you constantly, at least they should, and, you, and your professor said, well, so I'm doing it again, right? Concentrate, right? right? You can do only so, you think you can do everything, and there's a lot you can do because you're young. But uh, you cannot do everything, right? So you need to concentrate in order to finish. You need to finish your studies. You need to finish uh, uh, projects that you start in your job and, and so on, right? So Mises' theory has a microeconomic foundation rooted in everyday experience. And he uh, also highlights that this applies as well to the macroeconomy, right? From a macroeconomic point of view, it's the same thing. Okay, in the theory of money and credit, he had uh, already started highlighting the importance of monetary calculation for the operation of um, uh, market economy. And uh, this was the starting point for a grand critique of socialism that he uh, published 10 years, late, uh, 10 years later. And, uh, Mises came to realize that um, money is not just a veil, it's not just an expression of value uh, that is therefore um, a, a completely um, superficial phenomenon from an economic point of view. That is, you can, could run an economy just as well with money as without money, which was, in fact, the conviction uh, held by uh, Friedrich von Wieser, uh, so one of the, his, his predecessors at the University of Vienna. And of course, it was the uh, conviction of all socialists, right? for all socialists until the present day, uh, by and large, you can run an economy without money. You have central planning. Right? You can organize a division of labor. You do not necessarily need money. And Visa even thought you could calculate in terms of subjective value. Uh, like some economists still today believe that you can calculate in terms of utility. Right? And so Mises said, no, you're completely wrong. You never calculate in subjective value. You never calculate in terms of utility. There is no such thing as a substance of utility that you could add up or subtract and so on. And if I explained to you in my lecture a few days ago, uh, value is a relation. It's a bundle of relationships. It's not a substance. And because it's a bundle of relationships, it's contingent to each uh, particular situation. So you cannot compare one value to another. Right? Uh, so Mises says, well, so what we calculate is never in terms of value. We calculate only in terms of money. Calculate in terms of the medium, the price is paid in terms of the generally uh, used medium of exchange. Now that means that the division of labor and all of civilization is contingent to a particular set of institutional environment. Only if you have a monetary economy, you can have a widespread division of labor. Only if you have money, you can have uh, very roundabout production processes. You ca can have an extended division of labor. If you don't have money, you, you will, will, ne will never have this. Right? So there is no choice here, right? If you want all of these uh, 
achievements of civilization, well, then you have to say yes to money. If you want to have money, well, then you need to have private property because otherwise there's no exchange. Right? So there's a whole bundle of, of uh, implications that comes with it. So the socialists were completely wrong. Right? So he publishes an article in 1920 highlighting the socialist calculation problem. He says, well, you calculate only in terms of money. In a socialist economy, you do not have exchange because you do not have private property. Right? Uh, the central planning board uh, owns everything, so how can it possibly exchange any factor of production? Right? Uh, if you have private persons who have exchanged a factor of production, well, there's one uh, property owner who uh, seeds uh, whatever, uh, a piece of land or uh, petroleum and, and so on to some other property owner, so there is an exchange going on. If it all belongs to a central planning board, there's no exchange. As a consequence, there are no market prices. As a consequence, it's impossible to calculate. As a consequence, it's impossible to organize a widespread division of labor. Socialism is doomed. And it turns out to be right. So various other points that he also makes in this book. Um, uh, so he develops a political economy of the family and of, uh, as we would say today, gender relations, but in fact, sex relations, okay? Yeah, so relations between the sexes. Uh, what were the forces that created greater legal equality between uh, m uh, females and males? Uh, what is the role of feminism? What beneficial role can feminism play? What negative role is feminism likely to play in the modern world? And so on. He has a very uh, sharp uh, criticisms of uh, John Stuart Mill uh, in this book. He develops uh, the theory of monopoly uh, prices. Uh, and various other things. So I relate this in more detail in, in, in my book. You, you can look it up there. So the, the book is very rich in uh, individual points that he makes. So Mises, uh, 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 typically economist today, he would uh, draw, let's say, 40 articles or 50 articles out of a book like this if he is an honest uh, economist, right? Uh, so there's also some guys who publish the same thing twice, sometimes in different languages, or they change a few words here and there, so they get 120 articles, right? Then you can share with co-authors and so on and exchange your publishing rights <laughs> on the market, so you get even more, you get 250 out of this, right? So Mises didn't do all this mumbo jumbo, right? So he uh, published this, this one book, and I'll say a few things about the significance of this approach uh, later. Then 1949, he publishes uh, Human Action, which is the grand treatise on uh, economics outlook, which you have already heard. And here in Human Action as well, there, have, there are many contributions uh, beyond what had, he, uh, he had written uh, before. For example, he develops the theory of probability. Uh, it's a very important uh, chapter, chapter six, which did not exist in the German language uh, predecessor volume, right, in which he revises the theory of probability, and the, implicitly the theory of risk, uh, and highlights its significance uh, for economic analysis. Uh, he uh, presents the whole system uh, of his thought as it had uh, developed in the previous years. Uh, so there are foundations of economic uh, analysis, as the theory of the division of labor, and so on and so on. Right? But then uh, the development of all these elements depends on the institutional uh, setup. So it depends on whether you have private property or not. Uh, so then there is, once you have private property, uh, intellectual uh, uh, economic calculation comes into place. So the third part of the book deals with economic uh, calculation. Then you have the theory of the market economy. You have the theory of uh, interventionism. And you have the theory of um, uh, socialism all at its proper place. And also something that is very important in this book is that he uh, highlights the uh, epistemological underpinnings of uh, economic science, right? So Mises uh, defended a very uh, original position, which is still contentious today, namely that economics is a body of a priori theorems, or a priori assertions. Now, this is contentious uh, still today. It's a stumbling block, right? So, so many people who otherwise like Mises if they think that he is completely wrong uh, on this question, and certainly I will not try to convince you now in two minutes and a half, but uh, right, so it's just a point to be, to be noted that uh, is, is this original uh, position, and he explains why economics is an a priori science. And as opposed to, uh, to economics, then we have uh, other, uh, another intellectual approach to the explanation of reality, 
which is history, and history focuses on contingent relationships. So in eco economics, we have a priori universals, right, which hold true independent of what we observe and independent of what exists in the real world. Right? And they exist by virtue of what it means to act. Right? They spring from the nature of human beings. Right? So, for example, I choose. Uh, choosing means I prefer something to something else. This is something that I do not choose, right? that I always prefer something to another thing. Right? So this is an a priori feature of the human nature that exists wherever human beings exist, but independent of what they do and independent of their environment and so on. But on the other hand, of course, the environment and uh, the concrete intentions and, and projects and so on have an influence on, on the real world, but to analyze this is the job of historical research. Right? So therefore, this this uh, fourth book that I should uh, highlight, a Theory and History, in which he explains right, the epistemological uh, 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 foundations of, we would say today, social research. Right? It's not just economics, right? All, uh, economics, history, uh, sociology. How do they interrelate? What is uh, the crucial uh, distinction between a universal and a priori uh, statement and a concrete historical statement? Okay, so I said a few things about <clears throat> concrete contributions that Mises uh, made, but uh, as I uh, uh, already mentioned before, it, we would do would not do him justice if we just focus only on these individual contributions, like uh, describing individual trees. If you want to say something about the forest, right? and Mises uh, uh, had a sense that is much lacking uh, today among contemporary economists. Uh, the sense for the importance of a system of thought. The whole point of economics is not to understand this or that isolated phenomenon. The whole point of economics is to understand the interrelations between all things uh, that are part of human action. Because all things are related through human action. Human action is, uh, springs right from the necessity of dealing with scarce economic goods. Right. So you do not understand economics if you are just an expert of the labor market, or of book production, or uh, whatever else. Right? You only only become an economist once you acquire a sense for and a knowledge of the interrelations between that concrete phenomenon and all the rest. Right? This is very important. Right? So therefore, then it becomes important in researching and in publishing to understand and to present the whole system, how things interrelate. That's what he did. Okay, And that's why he's still so important today, because few people, uh, especially if you look at economists today, few people understand the need for such a presentation, and even fewer are capable of doing this. Right? It's not completely extinguished, but it's, it has receded. And in Mises, we find this. Right? So Mises presents the whole system. How do things interrelate? in a coherent way. Maybe he's wrong. This is a different question. It right? doesn't mean that he has uh, uh, attained some sort of, of perfection and we cannot go beyond this. Or something. This is a different question. Right? But you need to understand the interrelation. Otherwise, you're not really a good economist. That's what he did. He did us a great favor and he gave us great, uh, this great model. But if we look, just look at human action now, it's already 9.45, but please allow me to take five additional minutes because I need to say a few important things. I feel it's important because it comes from me. <laughs> <laughs> if we just look at human action, we get the impression, well, we, because we see the full-fledged system, right? we, see, we get the impression, well, okay, there's this guy, is somewhat, uh, uh, he has the, figured out how things uh, work, and it seems to be kind of static, or even, you might say even dogmatic, right? But of course, that's what a system is all about. You have a, you have a dogma, right? And so it's, it's, it's an opinion of somebody who has thought a lot about these matters and has acquired a lot of uh, knowledge about this matter, has published this. Now, what he thinks is, is, is the truth. But what is even more important is uh, that we, we keep in mind that Mises actually uh, did not start off with these ideas. There was a slow progression toward these ideas. And uh, this progression did not stop uh, in 1949. Right? So there was a progression from the th uh, theory of money to the theory of socialism, to the theory of interventionism, socialism, uh, to finally get uh, a published human action. He, in the course of this process, he became interested in epistemological questions. 
It did not start off in 1912 or in 1906 as, wow, I, I think I like Kant and, and therefore uh, everything should be somehow a priori or so. It was not at all. He didn't even express himself on these questions. Uh, he, was very, he was a very painstaking, very careful uh, scholar right, who only said things about which he had thoroughly informed himself and then finally made a, a statement which he held to be true. Uh, so he didn't start off with, with some preconceived notion and then try to justify it at, uh, at all costs or so. He uh, didn't try to be original, but he insisted on those points that he felt were true, even if they were not popular. Uh, so he came to be interested in epistemological problems because one critique of the market economy, one critique of, uh, uh, of the market economy came through the critique of economics. And that critique said, well, economics is a class-based system of knowledge. It's bourgeois. It's a bourgeois science. Right? So you have to be born with it, uh, by, by and large. Right? Only if you belong to this class, then economics holds true, because your view is somehow distorted. But if you have an objective view, if you belong to the working class and so on, then you have a completely different view. Right? So this is, of course, a very nihilistic uh, way of, of arguing. And so Mises became interested in, so what is actually the basic of our exchange, of our argumentation, and so on. He became interested in questions of logic and of epistemology, uh, and so on. And then he started a second research project about uh, sin since 1927, 28 or so, which ran through the rest of his life, and which gave uh, the epistemological chapters in human action, in theory and history, and uh, in one of his finest uh, small books, uh, Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, published in 1962. Right? So Mises' thought was progressive, and it was even progressive within each of these fields. Right? His uh, theory of money, 1912, is not the same as the theory of money that he presented in 1949. It's essentially, right, the building blocks and so on, if we made the same, but there are lots of uh, developments, lots of nuances, uh, some of which we have highlighted in, in this book, which was published in another ad advertisement, right? Advertisement. Uh, <laughs> right? Published in 2012 is the centennial uh, uh, celebration uh, volume uh, on the occasion of the centenary of the theory of money and credit, which contains uh, articles written by young scholars and some, also some older chaps, such as myself, uh, highlighting the significance of Mises' monetary thought and the progression of Mises' monetary thought. So, in conclusion then, um, the significance of Mises is um, that he was certainly the, the, a fountainhead of intellectual opposition to, uh, to statism, to all forms of statism. But even more, Mises is, is, is a model because uh, he didn't, is, is a model as a scholar because precisely he didn't start off uh, by being uh, an anti statist. Right? He started off by being, having a passionate love for truth. And this is the true distinguishing mark of a scholar. You need to love truth. You need to love truth more than what you believed before. And that's what he did. He actually changed his opinion on very important points. He started uh, off as uh, uh, quite an interventionist, right? Quite a left-winger, as we would say today. Right? And he changed his opinion by becoming acquainted with economic theory. Uh, and he became ac acquainted with it by reading Karl Menga first. And he said, wow, this is, this is amazing. Nobody has ever told me about this. This is a realist theory of uh, value and of prices and of the economy. And then he started going back to the sources that Karl Menga quoted, most not notably classical economics. And then he fully understood what his own teachers had deprived him of. Right? And he changed his, his, his opinion. So this is the model of a scholar. Right. It's one thing to, we, of course, we, we, we cherish him also by giving us all these ideas uh, necessary in the battle, the political battle against statism. Okay, but more important, more fundamental still, uh, is, is the love of truth and, and scholarship. And so Mises was a model for all of us in that respect. And he was a model uh, not only, therefore, as a scholar, but also uh, as far as his personal integrity uh, is concerned. And I hope that well, uh, you will find some emulation among this groups and whoever else is watching us today. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>